courtesy of Bevan, VK5BD's ATV channel and YouTube channel, VK1 WIA National News, Wireless Weather and Radio Sport is next. From Australia, this is the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. This broadcast is in text, audio and video and is accessed on wia.org.au. It certainly is the national news and it's for week commencing April 17, the Easter weekend here in VK. I'm Graham VK4BB and ACMA finds Mile Coast radio station breached licence conditions. New South Wales-based radio station, Mile Coast Radio Incorporated, has been found to have breached a licence condition following an investigation by the Australian Communications and Media Authority. The station held a licence to provide an open narrowcast service. Now, these licences are issued for the purpose of niche broadcasting and, by law, must be limited in some way, such as being targeted to special interest groups, maybe racing, providing programs of limited appeal or being provided for a limited period of time or for a special event. The ACMA investigation found that Mile Coast Radio FM was broadcasting a mix of content, including live-hosted and automated music programs, news, weather bulletins that would likely appeal to a general audience in the broadcast area. ACMA Chair Nerida O'Loughlin said, Our investigation found the station was not targeting a limited audience as required under its licence. Mile Coast Radio FM has acknowledged its error and ceased its narrow car service, now operating purely as an internet radio station instead. Operating on internet, HF, VHF, UHF, ATV, in fact just about anywhere you can hear anything, is this WIA National News Service. And let's hear from Justin, VK7, Tangled Whiskers. The WIA Hybrid AGM and Virtual Conference 2022 has the theme of Antarctic Gateway and is open for registrations. This all takes place on May the 7th, 2022 and is being streamed from the Antarctic Gateway of Hobart, Tasmania. The Hybrid AGM stream starts at 10.30 AEDT with the open forum stream from around 11.30. Please note that if you wish to attend in person at the AGM or Open Forum, then you will need to register at the link on the text edition of this broadcast or on the WIA website. If you wish to receive the stream of the AGM and Open Forum, then a Memnet email will be sent to all members in the very near future that will enable you to register. After a short lunch break, the WIA Virtual Conference Antarctic Gateway kicks off with four special presentations that highlight the history, culture, research and communications associated with Antarctica. We start with Professor Ellie Leanne from UTAS and a presentation on Sydney Jeffries and the role played by Wireless in the Australasian Antarctic Expedition 1911-14. to Then well-known microwave experimenter Rex Moncur, VK7MO, who was the director of the Australian Antarctic Division between 1988 and 1999, will share his experiences, the good and the challenging. Dr Andrew Klekachuk from the AAD will then give us a fascinating presentation on the atmospheric studies and research happening in Antarctica. And we finish with Peter Yates, VK7PY, and Kim Briggs, VK7KB, both from the AAD, with a presentation on Antarctic communications challenges and review. Please note that if you wish to attend or receive the stream of the virtual conference presentations, then you will need to register at the link, and this is different to the AGM link and you can find the link in the text edition of the broadcast or on the WIA website. There is a small charge of $10 to cover organisational costs for the presentations and for further details check out the WIA website or Facebook pages. The 2022 Conference Organising Committee looks forward to seeing you on the streams and at 73 from Justin VK7 Tango Whiskey for the WIA National News. Now, international news with Jason, Victor Kilo 2, Lima Alpha Whiskey. With thanks to IARU, RSGB, RAC, Southgate Amateur Radio Club, ARRL, NZART, EHAM, Amateur Radio Newsline, and the worldwide sources of the WIA. Hello, I'm Jason VK2LAW. World Amateur Radio Day. 
It was on 18th of April 1925 that the International Amateur Radio Union was founded during the International Radio Telegraph Conference in Paris. Today, amateur radio is more popular than ever, with more than 3 million, that's 3 million, licensed operators. And that's why we radio amateurs worldwide celebrate April 18th with special activities every year. One society with special activities is Canada's RAC. Official stations will operate across Canada from 0 hundred Zulu to 2359 Zulu on April 18. The RAC official station call signs are all ending with RAC. In news from Region 1, RSGB and the Commonwealth Games. The 2022 Commonwealth Games starts on the 28th of July. Over 5,000 athletes will converge on Birmingham and the surrounding areas from an estimated 72 hosts to compete over 12 days as part of the Games. The RSGB is organising a number of activities to support the event, including a special event station in the grounds of the National Exhibition Centre. The Society wants to showcase amateur radio to the athletes and public for as much of the Games as possible and is asking for UK volunteers to operate the station and chat to visitors. As we say in the classics, stay tuned. Still with news from RSGB, new RSGB EMF video published. Yes, a short video outlining new EMF regulations in the UK and the guidance and tools the RSGB provides for radio amateurs. On April 9, Finland's communication regulator Traficom added the use of encryption to the amateur radio licence. Radio amateur communications are not usually allowed to be concealed, however two forms of radio amateur communication have been added to the order, which are allowed to be encrypted, and the renewed order allows encryption in the case of the proportion of the message that ensures the integrity of the sender and the messages, control communication between Command Earth Station and the satellite for radio amateur activities, and the control communications of a radio amateur station for which a special licence for a radio amateur station as referred to in Section 5 is required for the possession and operation of a radio amateur station. In news from Region 2, the Yasmi Excellence Award. The Yasmi Excellence Award is presented to individuals and groups who, through their own service, creativity, effort and dedication, have made a significant contribution to amateur radio. The contribution may be in recognition of technical, operating or organisational achievement, as all three are necessary for amateur radio to grow and prosper. The Yasmi Excellence Award is in the form of a cash grant and an individually engraved crystal globe. The Board of Directors of the Yasmi Foundation is pleased to announce the latest recipients of the Yasmi Excellence Award. Dan Marla Kilo 7 Romeo Echo X-Ray, when the COVID pandemic led to cessation of in-person meetings, training sessions and gatherings, Dan converted a small limited membership Zoom platform to the open presentation forum known as Rat Pack. In the subsequent two years, Rat Pack has hosted over 200 online presentations that have been viewed by thousands of radio amateurs. Among the wide-ranging topics, half focus on public service communications, while the rest address technical, operating, scientific and general interest topics offered by a host of presenters. The recordings of these sessions are available for public viewing and constitute a valuable resource for the amateur radio community. Dr Gordon Gibby, Kilo X-Ray 4 Zulu. Gordon is a retired emergency room physician turned high school science teacher who demonstrates how amateur radio can benefit our communities in a wide variety of ways. As an ARIS leader in northern Florida, Gordon promotes and teaches all aspects of preparedness for disasters, from planning and exercises to building and repairing communications hardware to understanding official responders' needs, methods and organisation. He advocates cognizance of the amateur's role and its limits, building trust and relationships and constantly improving our individual skills. 
He's known around the USA for his informative and carefully thought-out responses to the many questions from other amateurs seeking to improve their local disaster response capabilities. In Brazil, the long wait for ham licences has become even longer as applicants waiting for their radio amateur licence report that at least six months have passed in some cases and they're growing impatient. Brazil's National Amateur Radio Society has asked Anatel, the nation's regulator, to act promptly and resolve the delays for the waiting candidates. The group is asking the regulator to modernise its computer system and standardise processes across all of the Brazilian states. And in news from Region 3, back on Saturday, February 5th, Thailand's regulator, the National Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission, hosted an intermediate class amateur radio examination. The exam was held at Bangkok University and was overseen by RAST. A total of 78 novice class licence holders took the exam, of which 52 candidates passed the Morse code test. Thailand's three classes of licence are novice, entry-level basic licence 100 watts on 28 MHz, 60 watts on 144 MHz, intermediate 200 watts on all bands, and advanced licence 1 kilowatt on all bands. In addition to the theory exam, an eight-word-per-minute Morse test is required for intermediate. For VK1 WIA National News in Sydney, I'm Jason, VK2LAW. This is the home service of the Wireless Institute of Australia through VK1 WIA. Now operational news with Felix, VK4 FUQ. Hello there. Results of Commonwealth Contest 2022 released. The results of the 85th Commonwealth Contest, held March 12 and 13, have been released. In overall, QSO numbers ended up similar to 2021, but there was much more activity on both 15 and 10 metres. Total submitted logs were 268, showing consistent support for this contest over the last decade. One disappointment was that although the call area VK8 was active, no one in VK had submitted a log. Now, contest wise, still to come in 2022. Harrow Angel Memorial 80 metre sprint, Saturday, May 7th, 2022. 10 hours UTC to 11.46 UTC. The Don Edwards Memorial Slow Morse Contest, two days starting May 14, 1800 hours, including May 15, 1600 hours. Saturday evening 14 May between 6 pm and 9 pm Eastern Standard Time on 80 metres. Sunday afternoon 15 May between 1 pm and 4 pm Eastern Standard Time on 40 metres. International CQ Pride Contest June 4 to 6. New Worldwide Digital Contest also June 4 to 6. BK Shires Contest 11 June 2022. WIA VHF UHF Field Day is winter 2022. 0200 hours UTC, Saturday 25 June, through 0159 hours UTC, Sunday 26 June. Dippers and BK6. IARU Hedgehog World Championship next contest is July 9 and 10. WIA Trans Tasman Low Band Contest, 16 July 2022. The Trans Tasman Contest, held on the third weekend in July, aims to encourage low band activity between VK and ZL. DX Window, Guyana, 8R. Hesmond, 8R1AK has been active on 10 metres using FT8. QSL2, 8R1AK, home call. South Cook Islands, E5. Bob, E51BQ is QIV from Rarotonga. Iota, OC013. And is normally active using FT8 on 30 and 20 metres from 0500 to 0600 Zulu daily. New Caledonia, FK. John Louie, F5, NHJ, is QIV as FK stroke F5, NHJ from Namia until June 11. HF bands using CW, SSB and various digital modes. QSL via low TW. Hungary. Members of the Solosi Azosiv Radio Club are QRV as HG 
1222BA to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the first constitutional document in continental Europe called the Iranani Bula. QSL fire HA4KYB Austria OE Joe OE6VIE is QRV as OE0 Morse during April to commemorate the death of Samuel F.E. Morse QSL via LOTW Mario IZ3KVD is in Zambia using the call sign 9J2MYT He will be there in Lusaka until June Listen for him on SSB on 40, 20, 17, 15 and 10 metres Send QSLs via IZ3KVD For VK1WIA National News I'm Felix vk 4 fu Winningham. A quick little note now from the Q News Workbench, the Nuts and Bolts Report. Whiz 3D Parts. 3D printed accessories for electronics enthusiasts and ham radio operators. Now, the link that you'll find in the text edition is a collection of 3D printed designs for hobbyists in electronics and amateur radio who want to add those really neat finishing touches to projects. You'll find it at whiz3dparts.co.uk and you'll find it in the text edition. This is the home service of the Wireless Institute of Australia through VK1WIA. Now, special interest group news with Cole, VK3GTV. Hello and welcome to the Easter edition of Worldwide Special Interest Group News. And first up, well, very up, it's Worldwide Special Interest Group's ballooning. Radio amateur Chris Murphy, KD2MRV, has been teaching students how to build and launch high-altitude balloons that carry an amateur radio APRS payload. The Gloversville Leader Herald newspaper reports, once a weather balloon is launched, payload attached, Gloversville Middle School science teacher Chris Murphy is behind the wheel, ready to drive to wherever the landing site might be. In the back seat are students following the airship on computers and punching in data to help determine his directions. The advisor for the school's district High Altitude Achievement Club has been going on these adventures with students since 2013, and ham radio operators along the route and at home bases help direct too. The experience varies from a car caravan to a single vehicle, and from students on a second or third launch to their very first. The 17th and most recent launch, a month back on March 17, was, however, a first. It was the beginning of a launching era, including 8th graders in the experience. Prior to the launch day, the older students help KD2MRV with work related to piecing together the payload. The most recent one included QR code cards sent to Teachers in Space, a non-profit focused on stimulating student interest in STEM learning by providing teachers with space experiments and industry connections from students at different schools in New York scanned at launch and recovery and a prototype of the Serenity satellite to be put into orbit by Firefly Aerospace, which contained a 30-sensor microcomputer and two cameras. Worldwide Special Interest Group News, Summits on the Air, Worldwide Flora and Fauna Program, Parks on the Air, and other adventure groups. There's only three weeks to the Dorigo Park Fest, which is being held on the weekend of 7th and 8th of May. This is a park activation weekend where many activators will focus their efforts on parks in the Dorigo region west of Coffs Harbour. For those who would like to join us, it's not too late. With the Danga Falls Lodge still having a few rooms left and there are tent and van sites available. All amateur radio operators are welcome and if you have never operated from a park for the WWFF or POTA programs and would like some help getting involved, then come along and we will show you the way. Park activators need park hunters. So hunters, warm up your rigs as it will be a massive weekend for you. For more information, search out the Facebook group called Dorigo Park Fest, that's Park Fest with a hyphen in between the words, or email Marty, VK4 Kilo Charlie, or Alan, VK2 Mike Echo Tango, whose emails are on their QRZ pages. Worldwide Special Interest Group's Final Frontier, AMSAT A07. The Methuselah of amateur radio satellites, AMSAT Oscar 7, was launched on the 15th of November 1974 from Vandenberg Air Force Base. The spacecraft is solar-powered. 
weighs just under 29 kilograms and had a three-year anticipated lifetime at the time it was launched, but it has far outlived this expectation. Its beacons transmit on 29.502, 145.975, 435.10 and 2304.1 megahertz. Two types of communications repeaters are aboard the spacecraft, only one of which operates at a time. The first repeater is a 2-watt non-inverting transponder receiving uplink signals between 145.85 and 145.95 MHz and retransmits them between 29.4 and 29.5 MHz on the downlink. The second repeater is a 40 kHz bandwidth inverting linear repeater. It employs an 8-watt PEP power amplifier with wide dynamic range. This repeater has an uplink from 432.125 to 432.175 MHz and downlink from 145.975 to 145.925 MHz. In 2002, one of the shorted batteries became an open circuit and now the spacecraft is able to run off just the solar panels. It's not usable in Eclipse and may not be able to supply enough power to the transmitter to keep from frequency modulating the signal. When continuously illuminated, the mode will alternate between A and B every 24 hours. Proving that the satellite is still alive and well after 48 years of service, a new distance record has been posted to AMSAT on the 23rd of March. Joel, VE6WQ, based in Edmonton, Alberta, worked Jerome, F4DXV, who describes himself as an extreme low elevation contact enthusiast based in the southwest of France. They used mode A, uplinking on 2 metres and downlinking on 10 metres over a distance of 7,454 kilometres. Well done. Worldwide Special Interest Groups, CW. For some CW enthusiasts, the joy of a successful QSO can be music to one's ears. Amateur Radio Newslines' Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF, explains. If you hear Chris Rio sending CQ, CQ, DE, ZL4RA in his latest YouTube video, don't ask him what key he is using. You're better off asking, what key? Could it possibly be C major we're hearing from him? No matter. Chris is using his fingers instead of his fist because he's not in his shack. He's demonstrating CW on his electric guitar. In the video, we hear a response from Adam K6ARK, a California amateur who shares Chris's enthusiasm for another ham radio pursuit, Summits on the Air. Chris and Adam exchange signal reports, with Adam using a more conventional and non-musical instrument of CW. Then, just like that, it's all over. Fine business. Chris shared his musical experiment, as well as the video, with friends on the Soto Reflector and apparently found a symphony of support. In fact, Brian, G8ADD, confessed he had also tried the same thing once with his clarinet. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Jim Meachin, ZL2BHF. Thanks, Jim. And here in VK, Ron, VK3AFW, suggested having a go with... Bagpipes. Many who know Ron from his Soda and Parks activities may see the irony of a bag of wind. Hi, hi. And whether the next instrument is wind or percussion, one thing is certain, it's sure to be a concerted effort. And on that note, time to check out the latest Worldwide Special Interest Group news of Yota, Youth on the Air, with Alec, VK2APC. Thank you, Cole. Philip 5B4. A QC DK six SP chair of the youth working group IAR U one reminds us of the upcoming Yoda contest and hopes to get even more people involved into the contest this year. The date of the first contest is the twenty first of May from zero eight hundred to nineteen fifty nine UTC. So are you ready to compete within the next Yoda contest? Everyone in the ham radio community can take part. It only lasts 12 hours. Its aim is for us youngsters to increase our activity on the air, strengthening the reputation of the Yoda program and demonstrate the support for youngsters across the world. 
The contest exchange used will be the age of the participating operators. Different ages also serve as multipliers during the contest. Contacts within an operator's own continent are worth one point, working DX is worth three points, and the most points will be achieved by working youngsters. The younger the operator, the more points one will get for the QSO. If you have any further questions, feel free to drop the Yoda Contest Committee an email at the link shown in this WIA National News script. For VK1 WIA National News, I am Alec, VK2 APC in Sydney. Now back over to you, Cole. Thanks, Alec. Moving on to Worldwide Special Interest Group's Rescue Radio and an important role of radio hams in emergency preparedness. Hawaii Public Radio, KHPR, this week reported on amateur radio operators who participate in a statewide emergency communications commencing a drill on Saturday, April 16. The exercise simulates a four-day period of catastrophic weather that knocks out power, internet and cell towers from Kauai to the Big Island. It's an opportunity for the Group Amateur Radio Emergency Service Hawaii to train members and non-members in radio operations and procedures. Links in the text edition allow you to hear this radio report from Hawaii. That wraps up the segment for this week, and please take extra care on the roads if you're travelling around during the Easter break. For WIO National News, I'm Cole, VK3GTV. From Australia, this is the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. Available on RF and on demand 24-7 from the wia.org.au website. 2022 social scene, VK5, the South Coast Amateur Radio Club's buy and sell, Sunday, April 24, not long to go. And VK2, Mayhem at Wyong Racecourse, 8.30am, May 1. Two weeks to go and the cogs are moving to make this the best event yet. The car-based and pedestrian fox hunts are arranged. The pedestrian fox hunt will be with four fox transmitters. The exhibitors and lecturers are eagerly preparing what they will put on show and talk about and the traders are looking for what bargains they can offer. Only at Mayhem 2022. Lectures range from summits on the air to Winlink messaging system and several other topics. Even if you have already bought your raffle tickets online, there will be the opportunity to spend more cash and buy some more on the day to increase your chances of winning the great prizes. To give quicker entry, you can buy your entry tickets online in advance. Details and the needed link to the online payment system in the online shop at the website at mayham.org.au. That's M-A-Y-H-A-M dot O-R-G dot A-U. If you're travelling to Wyong from further away, don't forget the meet and greet on Saturday evening before the big event on Sunday. The CCARC is known for its repeaters, and whether you're looking for Analog FM, DMR, D-Star, Echo Link, or even IRLP in the Summersby repeater site, it's close at hand to provide the needed coverage. If you can't get this year, but want to listen in to see what is happening, there's even a web SDR covering 6 and 2 metres, 70 and 23 centimetres. As long as the weather permits, this year we will have a working demonstration of portable HF radio. And... We're even hoping to be able to demonstrate satellite communications as well. In case you spot that bargain with the traders or in the car boot sale area and don't have enough cash with you, as usual, there will be ATM facilities available. Raffle terms and conditions and complete information about everything at Mayhem can be found at mayham.org.au. The CCARC look forward to seeing you at Wyong. For the Central Coast Amateur Radio Club, I'm Ed Durant, VK2JI. From Wyong, we go right across VK. It's the virtual event, the WIA AGM, May 7. In VK3, it's Morab and Hamfest, May 14. Oxley Region Amateur Radio Club's Field Day happens June 11 and 12. The Australian Fox Hunting Championship and the third convention at Mount Gambier, also the Queen's Birthday Weekend in June. And in Perth, it's Perth Tech, October 21-23. Now, in having brought you all the news that's fit to print, fit to hear, I'm Graham, VK4BB. Walk softly. This is VK1 WIA. All points of contacts from today's news stories are to be found in print when you read the web editions. 
www.wia.org.au. From Australia, this has been the Wireless Institute of Australia with the weekly news service. This broadcast is in text, audio and video and is accessed on wia.org.au. Courtesy of Bevan, VK5, BD's ATV and YouTube channel, this has been WIA National News. We're back now, live and local, and your voice, your callbacks. And don't forget, tick like. We have an Earth-directed solar storm and on its heels, a fast wind chaser. Those stories and more in the news this week. This space weather forecast is sponsored in part by Millersville University. Come get certified in broadcast space weather. Visit millersville.edu slash swen. Space weather this week has definitely calmed down compared to last week, but man, things are still pretty exciting. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, you can see two coronal holes. One of them had been passed through the Earth strike zone, and we've been getting a little bit of storming from that. But back on the 11th, pow, right there, did you see that? That was an Earth-directed solar storm from old region 2987. And in fact, when we take a look at coronagraphs, you can see there's a full halo right there that confirms that this storm is Earth directed and we'll talk more about prediction models in a minute but once that storm arrives you can see there's another coronal hole off to the sun's east that coronal hole is going to be sending us some fast solar wind right on the tail of this solar storm so we're going to kind of get a one-two punch and that should bring some decent aurora down to mid latitudes maybe for a day or two before things begin to quiet down meanwhile the solar flux has kind of died down a little bit. We only have two active regions on the Earth-facing disk right now, so it's a big difference compared to about a week ago. Nonetheless, we're still hovering about 100 for solar flux, which means amateur radio operators and emergency responders, your propagation should still be pretty good in uh, on the day side, but things might calm down a little bit before they get better. Now, as we take a look at our far-sided sun, this is Stereo A, and it's looking at the sun just a little bit from the sun. You can see those two coronal holes early on, but they begin to rotate off of the sun's west limb in stereo's view. You can also see on the 11th that big BAM right there, that big uh, solar storm that's headed toward Earth. But now take a look on the, the stereo's east limb. You can see a few regions that are rotating into stereo's view and a couple of them are, especially the one in the north, these are solar storm producers. So these look like they could actually begin to give us some decent uh, boost to that solar flux. They also might be big flare players. We won't know for another three or four days, but as they begin to rotate in stereo's view and into Earth view, it looks like Aurora chances are still going to be on the horizon. Now getting back to that solar storm, we switch to our prediction model Enlil. Now this is NOAA's version of the model, the top panel's density, the bottom panel's velocity, and you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. And when we take a look, you can see that solar storm launching, but you can also see that it's launching, especially if we look down at the bottom panel, you can see that sea of green. That sea of green that's chasing that solar storm, that is the fast solar wind. So you can see that we're actually going to get hit by that solar storm first, and then that fast solar wind will come as a chaser. In fact, that fast solar wind is actually causing this storm to be a bit of a density plug. So it's actually going to be quite dense, we think, as it comes and hits hits Earth. It also will be a direct hit. In fact, the impact is expected to be about 8 o'clock UTC time on the 14th, according to this model, and it should bring us some decent aurora clear down to mid-latitudes. Now, as we switch to the NASA's version of the model, again, you're looking down at the sun from the North Pole with Earth being off to the right. In this case, the solar storm being launched is a little bit slower. The impact is a little bit later, coming closer to about noon on the 14th. But either way, that's a pretty good agreement, and we should see aurora down to mid-latitudes. It's definitely a direct hit. So uh, all you Aurora chasers, be sure to keep your batteries charged. 
Switching to our moon, we are now passing through the second quarter phase on our way to a full moon with a full moon on the 16th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora during a solar storm, you're going to need to check your local rise and set times because you have this bright companion that might make things a little bit tough. Switching to your solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating the hit from that Earth-directed solar storm with that fast wind chaser, and this should be a pretty good hit. In fact, at high latitudes, NOAA is expecting major storm conditions with up to about an 80% chance of a major storm, in fact, and this could last over a couple days from the 14th into the 15th easily before things begin to settle down over the weekend. So your war photographers at high latitudes, definitely get ready for this show. I know some of you are worried about that, that midnight sun coming up or beginning to lose your nighttime hours. So this may be the really uh, last big chase of the season for you. Now, mid-latitudes, we're not expecting as hard a hit, just minor storm conditions, but we do have up to about a 25% chance of a major storm. And again, it could last in through the beginning of the weekend before things settle down because of that fast solar wind. So get ready, Aurora Chasers, even even at mid-latitudes, you could be in for a show. Switching to your solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week, everything is back to being in the green. In fact, we only have two active regions on the Earth-facing disk right now. This is region 29, 88, and 89, and neither of them are big flare players, so we don't really have to worry about that. So you GPS users, you should be very happy. You should have great GPS conditions for reception on Earth's day side. Now, because of this, we also have solar flux kind of not really tanking, but just kind of going down a little bit. We're back into the double digits for the first time in, oh my goodness, I don't know, maybe a month or so. It's likely not going to last all that long. We're going to be hovering around 100. So radio propagation on Earth's day side should remain pretty good. It's just Earth's night side that might be a problem when that solar storm hits that could cause you some issues. So be aware of that. And now also we basically have climbed out of solar minimum. So the cosmic ray flux has definitely settled down and we have no risks for radiation storms right now. So we're back into the D1 normal range and that means everybody is in the clear. So the space weather this week is definitely very exciting. We have an Earth-directed solar storm that should be hitting us right around the 14th, probably before noon, and it could bring aurora clear down to mid-latitudes. Now, it will be chased also by some fast solar wind that could extend the storming a little bit longer, and that means great news for aurora photographers, both at high latitudes and mid-latitudes. Keep your batteries charged because you could get a decent show. Now, amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you you know, things aren't too bad. We have dipped down back into the double digits for solar flux on Earth's day side, but just barely. So radio propagation on Earth's day side should remain pretty good. We definitely don't have any risk for radio blackouts. And the only thing you need to worry about is when that solar storm hits, you might get a bit of disruption on Earth's night side. But hang in there because it looks like we've got new regions rotating into Earth view here in the next week that will then boost that solar flux back up into the triple digits for you. And now GPS users, well, you know, it's not so bad. The day side is pretty quiet. We don't have any radio blackouts, so your reception should be perfect on Earth's day side. And then on the night side, well, as long as you steer clear of Aurora and clear of those dawn dusk uh, terminators during that solar storm, your GPS reception should be pretty top-notch. I'm Tamitha Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.